So um, yes, I'd like to welcome everyone to our um, wonderful webinar this evening. Uh, the New Economy Network Australia, or NINA, now has a brand new democracy and governance hub um, led by Sonia and Karen, who will talk to you um, about that work later. But tonight's um, discussion is actually about citizens' assemblies, a topic that's incredibly important and growing in popularity around our nation at the moment. So we're really, really delighted to have um, these lovely folks share with us what they're all about and how we can use them. Before we jump into that, though, I'd like to do a, an acknowledgement of country. I'd like to acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging on this beautiful country that I live on in North Brisbane, um, which is the traditional lands of the Yagara Turrbal peoples, especially the Turrbal peoples here in North Brisbane and around Banyo. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the remarkable civilization and governance system that cared for country and cared for kin for millennia. And as a descendant of the colonizing humans who came here uh, in the last 200 years, I also like to acknowledge my part as a settler colonizing community and my personal obligation and commitment to decolonizing um, our society and living in true partnership and true solidarity. I'd also like to um, just tell you all about the New Economy Network Australia. Um, I was going to show a website, but I think most of you may have seen it. But if you go to neweconomy.org.au, you'll find out about NINA. NINA is um, a rapidly growing network. Our main mission in life is to help individuals and organisations across civil society join together, find each other, um, and find ways to share information, provide peer-to-peer -peer support, and provide a community of practice in the building of essentially what we were trying to achieve is um, a society that's fair, just, and ecologically centered so that um, everybody can live um, in a comfortable and happy way into the future. And, and that includes all the plants and the animals as well. So um, neweconomy.org.au, We've got a really fantastic structure. We worked hard to build Nina as a, uh, I was gonna say deliberative democracy, but that's what we're talking about tonight a bit. Um, a distributed governance model. We have lots of hubs bubbling up around Australia from different sectoral interests to different geographic places. Um, and inside those hubs, people can come together and share information with others in the network, um, thereby ensuring that um, Nina is first and foremost, a wonderful space for cross pollinization um, we see a lot of people from a lot of different walks of life and a lot of different sort of um, knowledge base backgrounds sharing with each other outside of their usual sectors. Just some reminders, we've got the New Economy Annual Conference is coming up um, from the 20th to the 22nd of November. It's all online. And we've got, I'm really excited about our very first short course, uh, Building a Wellbeing Economy, uh, which we're doing in partnership with Griffith University and the Yunus Centre. And I can see Kimberly and a few others who've signed up. Thank you so much. Can I just say, we wanted 15 people to sort of break even and have the university love us. And we've just hit 25 people registered and paying for the course. So hooray. Um, there be Most of what Nina do, does is for free. Our webinars are for free. But this course is a way of actually infiltrating people outside Nina and bringing them into the, the lovely open arms of the new economy movement. Um, I don't think I have any other housekeeping uh, to, to bore you with, but if anyone is um, keen to connect with and support Nina's work, um, everybody's welcome. Bring your expertise and your enthusiasm um, and visit our website for info about um, both membership, the hubs, and many other fun-filled things. But on that note, I'm going to hand over to Sonia um, and she's going to introduce, I'm going to hand over to Amy. and She's going to introduce um, this wonderful team of women, might I add, all women, um, to talk about this evening's topic. Thank you so much, ladies. Thank you, Michelle. So um, my name is Amy Meehan. I'm from Maitland, New South Wales, the heart of coal country. Um, I'm Gamilaroi Irish Australian. Um, and the beginning of discussions tonight, I now take a moment, and I hope you will join me, to be thankful to our ancestors, to acknowledge country, uh, the custodians and elders of this land, I'm thankful to my Gamilaroi ancestors, to the ancestors and custodians of both Waramai country uh, where I grew up and Wanarua country where I now live and work. Uh, I thank them for their endurance, the enormous skill and judgment in taking care of country as far as it is made accessible to them 
uh, for keeping knowledge alive, uh, keeping it accurate, and for the deep skills of natural democracy, uh, gender parity in our culture, despite unresolved sovereignty uh, over our land. Uh, if anyone would like to, please feel free to acknowledge country where you are, perhaps in the Zoom chat or uh, in discussion later. Um, now, uh, bef before I get to kind of uh, introducing the others, I think we'll just do it as we go, won't we, Sonia? So I'll hand over. Cool. So I've been asked to, very kindly asked to kick off tonight's discussion. Um, and I want to thank the New Economy Network Australia for honouring the Uluru Statement uh, from the heart by including my voice here tonight. Um, I'm interested in, in having discussions with you after the speeches. Um, for now, I'll assume the reason why you're here is because you want to make democratic change. You have ideas uh, how things could change um, or you want to be in discussion with others who have the same worries as you do. And I'm a big believer in, in better systems from the bottom, um, the bottom up. And I suppose I see one of my roles um, and the roles of brave survivors of current systems uh, is to talk about both obvious and hidden failures, um, as well as talking about other forms of democracy. Um, I'll also warn you that I have a preference for conversation over Zoom, uh, you know, conversation like person to person over the chat, but I can accommodate any special needs. Uh, we'll, we'll check out chat just in case. Um, so the first, for the first uh, few minutes, I'll, I'll talk about three topics. Um, first, Australia's many natural democracies. Um, second of all, um, learned helplessness in governance and uh, reskilling for change. So as a continent, we have 120,000 year history uh, and, and the early part of that history is similar all over the world. Uh, we, we, we had small groups of people governing ourselves with systems of natural democracy. Um, but as the world has developed with agriculture and large, larger populations or growing pop populations of humans, um, we evolved villages, um, larger towns, and in some parts of the world, those developed into cities. Uh, and over time, they've been, there's been a several thousand year kind of shift from reverence for the earth uh, to, to kind of control by and high reverence for, for humans above other creatures. And governance um, has changed to fit this. Um, I often picture what our governance would look like if Indigenous Australia and the Westminster system even just met halfway. Uh, and although no system is perfect, I envy um, our neighbours across the ditch in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, th there's some great things happening there and there have been since you know, first contact. Um, as populations have grown globally, various forms of government, of course, have evolved. And in many cases, the systems of power have become centralised uh, due to that growing population and that move from, from um, small groups of people to, to towns to, to cities. Um, and in Australia's case, it's more than 162 years we've had representative government where one person represents the concentrated power of thousands of people. Uh, with only one action required of individuals every three years. Now, with, with first Australians, governance dif, dif, um, differs throughout our many nations. Um, but some of the commonalities across this land uh, include that governance is localised. Uh, we have strong ongoing connection and responsibility for our land. Uh, our systems of democracy are for all creatures, uh, not only human focused democracy um, and our cultural knowledge systems, spirituality, democracy and law are closely intertwined. So we also we have processes rather than tick, tick box kind of procedures and that um, that involves uh, processes of deep listening and yarning and knowledge systems based on ability and ongoing good character and service to each other. Um, and there's the individual and gender equality and empowerment to speak and contribute to decisions um, are historical across Australia in our First Nations. 
So, um, and the most recent example of that is the Uluru Statement itself. Uh, lots of consultation, lots of yarns and a two year process. So um, although forming representative governments um, through colonisation may have had the intention of efficiency, um, there are inefficiencies and disadvantages um, that one representative can't possibly have all the current information for thousands or indeed millions of people and act effectively in a crisis situation. Um, party systems override local needs and, and have their own kind of non-local business models of donations and access. Um, and, and the other effect of centralising power is a leadership skill shortage that has gradually taken place over many, many years. Uh, lack of autonomy um, and sometimes uh, skill of small groups to make life-saving decisions. And, you know, despite the best efforts of our current leaders, we've seen some of that, the effects of that during COVID and um, may see more of it as climate crisis effects and uh, the ability to respond locally to crisis, um, whether it's bushfires, etc. cetera, um, perhaps that is a consideration. So the next is um, the part I'd like to speak about as well is learned helplessness. And, and perhaps you can identify with this, this definition. This is a dictionary quotation, a condition in which a person suffers from a sense of powerlessness uh, arising from a traumatic event or persistent failure to succeed. Uh, it is thought to be one of the underlying causes of depression. Um, how many of you can perhaps identify with that? <laughs> um, so if you feel comfortable, pop something in the chat, raise your hand or, or what have you, it'd be interesting to see. No worries. Oh, we've got a thumbs up there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the condition is an, an ongoing an ongoing, ongoing potential pattern of inaction. Um, and it perhaps might not be a surprise to you to know that learned helplessness <clears throat> is actually a method of control. So from my own experience, life experience rather than any reading, um, and perhaps have, others have had life experience of, of this sort of nature, that despite policies, despite procedures, government commissions, royal commissions, even laws, um, court cases, uh, the outcome is not proportional to an offence, recommendations are ignored um, and no, no action is taken at all. Um, this is from my own experience of looking at government legislation kind of because I had to, um, not because I studied law, is that uh, if you look at um, government legislation, of various commissions in Australia, the highest power is often to notify Parliament um, rather than to prosecute. And that power is left to politicians of the day. Um, if any of you are unfortunate enough to be a victim of serious crime, uh, in theory with evidence to jail the offender, uh, victim support services provided by the state will perhaps gently prepare you for the disappointment and likely failure of the government prosecution. Um, and the additional trauma that this might bring. So the shining light that kind of can come out of this is that when we do have the opportunity to participate and be effective, um, it's, it's amazing. And I suppose the instances that we've seen recently, um, the illegal empowerment uh, outside of elections is uh, the most recent marriage equality survey um, Jackie Lambie allowing the public to decide about uh, refuge, refugee detainees, uh, access to mobile phones. Um, and, and you might have your own examples that you kind of go, yes, um, we wanted to say, and, and it felt good to, to matter. Um, the other thing I'll just point out is you may have noticed some parts of the, re the media regularly call for public opinion. Uh, to give a sense of empowerment. And uh, this is used as a, as a tool as well um, to help people feel that they matter certain purposes. 
So the last part of what I'll talk about is reskilling for change. Um, I'm a really big fan of my First Nations elders who have conflict resolution skills that have the stamina and the ability to listen, um, to not shoot insults at the other side, to address concerns and have extensive and well-reasoned discussion and respect for the other side and make changes together. Um, which leads me to someone really important globally that we've just lost, even though she's not Indigenous and she's not um, a person of colour, is Ruth Bader Ginsburg has done this really well. Um, she had the ability to show how certain laws hurt both men and women, um, creating legal change with those arguments, uh, well-reasoned arguments. And I suppose part of the Black Lives Matter movement uh, the point of it is that although First Nations and people of colour are some of the most vulnerable and we suffer the, the most consequences, um, that if it, it can happen to us, then it can happen to you. And uh, so what that consequently means is that the wins that we have together are actually everyone's wins. And that we've seen that with civil rights movements across history. Uh, so I believe in common ground and, and a lot of people, um, perhaps because of social media that we've gotten used to, sometimes addicted to, um, are against centrism. Um, I'm not sure if I classify myself as a centrist, but uh, I believe in common ground. And um, as you can kind of gather from, from parts of social media and also various things like the social dilemma, uh, which has recently been on Netflix. Um, if we keep the disagreeing parties away from each other, uh, then I think there's a reason for that. And it would be a dangerous thing indeed if each side discovered that they agree on quite a few things. <laughs> um, and, and I suppose one of the tools I feel is, is a good one for, for getting... Um, across the aisle to have those discussions, those really deep, uh, long discussions about issues, whether that's in people's assemblies or what have you, is that they're actually innovation courses that the federal government have been subsidising for quite some time through universities. Um, and they help you to reach and, and test ways of reaching people who you would otherwise not talk to. Uh, to have or to at least start to, to try to get them in the same room and have those conversations. Um, so the last point I'll make is that I also believe in trying to create intentional minority governments. Um, perhaps that can be discussed in breakout rooms or what have you as a tactic uh, worth talking about perhaps if people are interested in it um, because as we know several governments ago... Oh, sorry. <laughs> So that's my Burma, that's my dog. So he's a short, uh, a stumpy tailed red cattle dog, looks a bit like a dingo. <laughs> Sorry. Well, he's, he's obviously sharing his views this evening. Thank you, Nate. <laughs> um, but if you want to talk about um, the, the possibility or, or, or some sort of way of organising for intentional minority government, um, several governments ago, uh, Parties were forced to work together, um, discuss and compromise, and this has had some enduring effects. So, and, and I would really love to hear any other ideas that people have, because I'm sure over the years, many people have had a lot of ideas. So I'll hand over now to Sonia, um, who I know through Coalition of Everyone, and she has a lot to say and is very knowledgeable on this subject, and she's very gracious and, and generous and aware of colonisation. So take it away, Sonia. Thanks so much, Amy. That, and thank you. That was really, um, I, I, yeah, I just hope that I can do justice to um, that talk that you just gave as well. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to share my screen. Um, so just bear with me a second while I do that. Um, and then start off by acknowledging that I am on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Eastern Kulin Nations and the Woi Wurrung language group, um, acknowledging that we owe a great debt to um, the wisdom and knowledge of 
Indigenous peoples here in Australia and elsewhere across the world, and that that debt hasn't ever been really acknowledged either, and that we still have a long way to go before we're even starting on the path towards any form of reconciliation. Um, I'm with a group called the Coalition of Everyone, and um, we believe in disrupting the politics of, of fear and building a politics of hope. So I'm going to be talking mainly tonight about citizens assemblies, but also mentioning um, other forms of deliberative democracy, in particular people's assemblies and participatory budgeting. That's by no means an exhaustive list of the different um, experiments that are going on around the world at the moment, because there is a um, growing awareness of the ways in which our democracies are failing us, um, elective democracies are failing us, and the ways in which we really need to be able to um, catalyze change um, to face the multiple crises, um, climate and ecological, as well as I think the social justice crisis that we're facing at the moment. Um, so, hold on, I can, there we go. Um, so my first point is that democracy doesn't necessarily or rarely equal elections. Um, if we look at the first sort of electoral democracy in the United States and the discussions of the founding fathers, they were quite explicit that the reason behind um, an electoral democratic system was that the ability to exclude people and the chances that um, you were more likely to retain power within an elite, um, even as you expanded the franchise. Um, to a large extent, the ways in which democracy has evolved since its early years has been an expansion of the franchise. But I think we also need to have a deep discussion, which is what I hope to help catalyze today, on whether or not um, we've allowed the term democracy to become usurped um, by the electoral process. And obviously I'm arguing that we have. Um, I have to click on the screen. Um, we know that electoral democracy is in crisis. It's been happening since the start of this century. Um, the quality of democracy has declined in 2016 in 72 countries. It's been um, worse than that um, since 2016. There have been a number of reports published this year which have also shown that the quality of democracy has been declining. Obviously, the US is a prime example of this, um, but we're also seeing a decline of democracy here in Australia um, and in other countries with electoral systems. Um, I think that what's really frightened me in the last few months is that um, there was a survey which showed among young Europeans that in response to, in particular, the climate crisis, they thought that authoritarian regime, that an authoritarian government um, might be a good idea by a very slight majority in order to handle the climate, um, the challenges that are brought up by the climate um, crisis. So I think that we are facing a situation where the faith in democracy is declining and that we need to have alternatives on the table to reinvigorate um, democracy and to reinvigorate people's faith in and belief in democracy. And I don't think that's going to happen necessarily through a reinvigoration of electoral politics. Um, be, and one of the reasons for that is because I don't think that democ electoral um, democracy provides us with governments that are fit for purpose. Um, the, it isn't just that there is a disconnect between the people who are um, at the very apex of the electoral system. It's that the system itself encourages that sort of concentration of power. And Amy spoke about this to some extent. I really liked the way she talked about the leadership skill shortage. By making it so that the governance is the preserve of those who are elected into power, which who are people who have the time and the skills to devote to running an election campaign, they have the resources to devote to running an election campaign, then you're excluding a large number of people from the governance of decisions in their everyday lives. Um, when you look at the responses of people who've been involved in deliberative democratic processes and how they feel empowered by that level of participation, and you compare that to how you feel after coming out of a voting booth, 
the difference is really stark. Um, and the other thing is it's inherently conservative because governments don't want to do what they fear might upset the apple cart either with voters or with those funding the um, their political campaigns. Um, and uh, um, Greenpeace has done a really um, a good video on the ties between the major political parties, for example, in the fossil fuel industry. And there's a lot of research around that sort of thing um, that's taken place. And it's not just here in Australia, it's international. Um, so I, it's, it's, hard, it's not just one bad apple. We're seeing this the same patterns happening across the world. There are, of course, and we've seen them recently in the last week, some um, small sparks of hope, the New Zealand election, um, for example. But um, in comparison to the scale of the problems that we have to fit, we need all hands on board and the systems are still divisive. So um, yeah, is government fit for purpose? This is um, a graph, which I'm sure that everyone on this call is at least vaguely familiar with, um, of the increasing concern with um, uh, about climate change that people have and showing that the majority of the population um, wants, well, uh, uh, um, uh, the, a large percentage of the population are very concerned about climate change. And it, part of this research also showed that the majority want action on climate change. And yet we still see that a huge amount of foot dragging from our politicians, even when they are splurging out vast sums of money um, to tackle the um, corona recession, it's still not going towards what's urgently needed in terms of infrastructure changes um, and social changes to help us be equipped to um, respond to and mitigate the climate emergency. Um, so I'm going to talk about three different types of deliberative democracy. I'm going to talk very briefly about People's Assembly because to um, they sort of also um, fill in the gaps between participatory budget, budgeting and citizens assemblies. So people's assemblies um, are informal, not informal, they are gatherings of people to discuss an issue, but they're not necessarily empowered to take decisions. And they are people who are self-selecting, they choose to be in the room. They're a really important way of spreading to, um, ideas and um, having discussions about important topics. And I'll talk a bit about the end about what I, my hopes and dreams for deliberative democracy. I am going to talk a bit more about participatory budgeting and citizens assemblies. So I'm going to start off with um, participatory budgeting. And again, I'm not by any stretch of the imagination giving this the attention it deserves, but just hoping to spark some ideas among people. I'm going to start off with the first big, large scale um, experiment in participatory budgeting in Porto Alegre and just briefly explain how that worked. Um, it started off with, um, if you look on the top line here, um, a process of direct democracy, which was basically people's assemblies. People were invited to come to very local assemblies. The processes involved tens of thousands of people um, and talk about what they wanted for um, spending priorities they propose budget, a uh, specific project, and elect delegates and budget councillors who would then sit on a budget council um, and they would nut out what the priorities were and then that would, and they would negotiate with government to get those priorities in place. And we're talking about a process that would take a long time um, and very, very local as well. So this first stage would involve over 10,000 people. Um, then there would be uh, there would be layers. It's it, this is a simplification. There would be layers of budgets that got before it got to the budget council, which would then um, negotiate directly with government. And they were spending the the majority of the municipal council's budget through a process that was proposed from the local area. Um, in Scotland, um, they have. Um, they have an accelerated program of participatory budgeting for local councils. So they started off with just spending 1.75 million pounds, um, but that's been increasing um, over time. Um, so this just shows the first generation of the um, participatory budgeting 
which showed that there was, say, 1.75 million pounds of project, 58 participatory budgeting um, processes, which on average funded about 28,400 pounds. And some of these processes, they involve school children. They, there were particular projects that were designed to involve people with disabilities, um, including people with learning disabilities. Um, so a real range of people that would not have been able to directly influence budgets in um, the sort of normal budgeting process. Again, this, this was all happening at a local council level. So local, um, local projects with money behind them. Um, they would take place in a deliberative fashion, which means people in small groups having discussions and making decisions about how to spend the pot of money that they've been allocated or to um, apply for pots of money. Um, so la the next thing I'd like to talk about is where my real passion lies, which is citizens assemblies. Um, so the first step of a, a citizens assembly is a more formal process of undertaking uh, you can, uh, process of deliberation. The idea behind a citizens assembly is you bring together a randomly selected demographic group of people, demographically representative group of people to deliberate upon a particular problem or an issue and that those suggestions are then taken seriously by government um, to inform, at the moment it's largely to inform policy rather than governing themselves. Um, and uh, a guy who runs a blog called John Gat uh, said, he says that he's found this in Aristotle. Nobody else really has, but there are allusions to it in Aristotle from what I gather from the discussion, that sortition is natural to democracy as elections are to aristocracy. Um, this was a graph that's been used quite a lot by the Sortition Foundation, who um, I also work for. Um, which shows the difference between um, the demographic representation, the demographics of the United Kingdom as a whole, and the demographics of the people who sit in Westminster. So you can see, even just at a glance, that the number of men vastly outweighs the number of women, that the people are a lot older than the average population. And if you look down, 90% of them are university graduates as opposed to 20% of the general population. 7% privately educated. The median wealth um, of the general population is 95,000 pounds, whereas it's over a million on the other side. So the people who sit in parliament are not the same as the people they represent. And you, there has been some recent research in the US which has shown that they tend to make more pro-rich, even if they come from poor areas in the US, they, uh, the ways that they vote disproportionately, they don't tend to reflect that. They tend to they don't tend to vote more on pro-poor policies, even if they come from a poor electorate. Um, I, I'm not gonna have time to show you this um, YouTube video, but if you um, have, a, I'll put the link into the chat after I've finished this um, presentation and um, share that with you. It's real, oh dear, sorry. I, I, um, and hopefully um, you'll have time. It's only a 15 minute one and it shows you how the Irish Citizens Assembly on Abortion worked, which was one of the first ones that really um, attracted a lot of attention. Um, the second stage after the sortition, which is the choosing of the random people that are demographically represented, is the step of um, deliberation. And this is the step that most people find most empowering. But again, that it really contradicts that experience of learned helplessness that, and it helps to address that leadership skills shortage as well. In Australia, the first citizens assembly that was held here to my knowledge was in 2009, which was a national citizens assembly on government, on government and on how government should be reformed. Um, it was a nationwide one. It was held in old parliament house and the youngest person there um, was, very reticent at the start. She was filmed at the start and at the end she was saying, I think I'm gonna run for prime minister one day. Um, so that, that building of leadership skills and building of confidence is 
um, noticeable. And it's that wasn't a sort of one off. You see that a lot in that. And it's this process of deliberation um, where people's it's about trying to listen to as many voices as possible to find the values behind the arguments rather than hear the loudest voices and the strongest opinions um, that tends to really round out the process and make it qualitatively different from what happens in parliament. Because what you're looking for is not um, public opinion, but public judgment. You're trying to get people to think about other people's opinions and see why they um, hold their opinions and how far they would be willing to move, which again is very different from the adversarial way of parliament. Um, so this, the sortition is the process of random selection. You then have your citizens assembly, which involves deliberation and information. So you have experts. Um, in the recent Kendall climate change inquiry in the UK, they had a mechanism whereby after the first round of experts, the um, citizens jury as it was there could then call their own experts in so that they had a chance to choose who it was that was going to inform the second round of expertise in the, the, in the, um, in the citizens jury. And that's also happened to some extent in one um, down in Victoria on Bow and Water where they have an ongoing iterative process of public submissions. So there are public submissions and then in a, a randomly selected assembly, then more submissions and then another assembly. And that process has been going on it's um, for a while now. Um, I think they've done the first phase of assembly and they're on the second phase of um, public um, uh, submissions. Um, whether or not they have influence depends to some extent upon how the assembly is relates to government. So as you're probably aware, in Ireland, there was a citizens assembly on um, marriage equality, a citizens assembly on abortion, which were both ratified by very similar percentages to the percentages that we saw um, supporting change within the citizens assembly. And I just think that's such a joyous photo, that one. Um, I'm not going to go into that. So if you want to find out more, um, please have a look at the Coalition of Everyone website, which I'll put in the chat. Um, there's an organization called Sortition Foundation. We have monthly meetings. I, can, I saw that there were at least one or two members here. Um, contact your council about holding them, but we're also going to have breakout rooms um, to discuss this a bit more. And feel free to email me. Um, that's my email address there, and I'm happy to put that in the chat as well. I'm going to stop sharing there. I suspect I've gone on far too long. Um, uh, and I'm going to pass over to Nerida, who is um, currently helping. She's with a group called um, Neighbours United for Climate Action in Moorland. Oh, shall we have a um, breakout session first, Nerida, and then you talk? Or shall we, because I think it would be nice to, for people to hear, talk rather than... Um, uh, listen to us for a bit more. Maybe if we have a break for 20 minutes and then come back and listen to you. Yep, break it up a bit. Yeah, let's do that. I think that's what we discussed before anyway. So what we'd like to do now is um, we've got 50 participants here um, and we'll break out into, I think, um, seven rooms. Um, there's 49 people now. Um, and so we'll break out into some room and just ask, um, we thought that a good um, question for discussion would be, how would you like to um, use these ideas uh, in your context, either in um, your community, geographic community, in groups that you're working with, um, or, and how you, whether you think that they would have any meaning to the work that you're doing already, because I'm pretty sure that most people here um, would, yes, would be interested in that. I will also try to answer questions in the chat while um, that's happening, and that's so that um, we can interact that way. So I'm going to split you out into breakout rooms. Um, I'll, um, and then bring the thing back maybe at five past eight. Just bear with me one second. Oh, and don't forget to mention times, folks. Uh, anyone in Queensland, she does not mean five past eight. 
I don't. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean in 20 minutes. Yes, so five past eight for everyone in daylight saving time and five past seven for us recalcitrant Queenslanders. And if you're in a different time zone, please do calculate yourself because my mathematical ability has now reached its maximum potential. Thanks, folks. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to do that and I will, I won't be joining a group so that I can have a look at that and I'll also send out a message um, when um, it's five minutes before, just in case anyone else is as time challenged as I am. Hi, do people here um, want to join breakout rooms or do you want to ask some questions or? If you're having any technical difficulties, I think Andrew, you might be um, having some problems.
I think I'm just going to join one of the rooms because there's one that seems a bit under sourced. So. Hopefully not, you'll all still be in the meeting.
I think that's everybody back now. Um, so what I'm going to do now is pass over to Nerida, who's going to talk about a citizens assembly that we're putting together, or a citizens jury or a citizens panel. These are all pretty much names for the same thing um, in um, Moreland. Nerida. Thanks, Anya. Um, so, hi, my name's Nerida and I am on the land of the Wurundjeri. Um, and it still is and always will be Wurundjeri land here. You know, at this time of year, it's when the sacred kingfisher returns um, and the Murnong flower. And, you know, these are things that are still happening. It's, you know, continues on. Um, so, um, gosh, it's just wonderful to be in the company of all of you and really, you know, Many of you would know more than me. Um, I still feel so new to this whole scene. Um, I grew up being very disengaged, um, not out of any, you know, disempowered reason, just thinking that politics didn't matter, that, you know, I, I lived a very privileged life. Um, you know, I'd hear my dad, a small business owner, you know, complain about taxes. And that was the only time that politics was mentioned in my house, um, just around taxes. Um, but, you know, then I'd hear Sarah Hansen Young, you know, be really outraged and, and speaking out and it made me realise, oh, like there are some other issues in the world beyond tax. Um, and, you know, that grew up, I left home as, you know, as soon as I started uni and moved to the other side of town and realised, you know, my world opened up and it's um, been a really exciting learning curve ever since then to learn that there are, you know, different ways of thinking and being. Um, and so then last year, um, you know, early in the year or whenever it was when um, Extinction Rebellion became really big in London and um, with those amazing actions and that caught my attention and, and realising, wow, you know, like governments are letting us down, you know, like it's not just about, you know, how much they're taxing you know, business owners, you know, there's a lot more going on and, and to realise for the first time that, um, you know, they hold our lives in their, in their hands. Um, so as we were in the lead up to the climate election, as um, many of us knew it, the federal, federal election last year, I um, volunteered and started handing out um, how to, uh, sorry, scorecards from the Australian Conservation Foundation. Um, and, you know, it was at our local polling booth all day. Um, and it was so insightful to, you know, I was, I was neutral, I wasn't from a political party, so people felt comfortable talking to me and, um, you know, people would come up to me and ask me, oh, where's the, you know, where's the Liberal how to vote card? And, you know, I'd have to say, oh, actually, you know, that person um, isn't allowed to stand anymore. You know, it's a big scandal or something to do with racism. I think Sonia remembers more than me. Um, and that, you know, these people, it happened several times, would say, ah. Oh, Oh, I'm still going to vote for them anyway, even though that can't, that won't count, they can't stand. And I, I found that really surprising. And then I, you know, would have other people come up to me and, um, you know, see the scorecard and they'd say, yeah, but, you know, I'm a loyal voter. I always vote liberals or I always vote ALP. And I'd think, but they don't know you always vote that. It's no one knows who you vote for. You can say one thing, but put in another. Um, and so it was just around that time last year when I just started to um, become more politically aware and engaged um, and interested in what other people in the community thought and what people were doing um, and realised how much anger there was um, towards our politicians, you know, even at the local level and, um, you know, see our um, our councillors trying to do amazing things sometimes and people getting outraged and saying, no, you're just meant to be focusing on rates, roads and rubbish. And, and it's just been really interesting um, for me to enter this space. Um, so last year after the climate election, um, I started a local um, group called Neighbours United for Climate Action. Um, just wanting to get more people engaged and empower them and connect them and um, and create a kind of network for people to be able to take action and, and, you know, that we'd support them and connect people and amplify their actions and, you know, kind of a network um, and support the other existing um, groups in our area. Um, and one thing that we did was um, we started a local community climate action series and we run 
of um, free sessions twice a month, um, normally at the local neighbourhood house, but right now it's been online. Um, and Sonia um, was one of our guest presenters for one of the sessions, and that was on citizens' assemblies. So we've covered everything from composting to citizens' assemblies to divestment to bike maintenance to everything. Um, but out of the citizens' assembly session, we had... Um, the president from the local neighbourhood house um, come along and we're in a breakout room and we got so excited. Um, so Sonia really, you know, sparked something there. Um, and so then recently we applied um, for a local government grant, um, a Thrive grant, which is designed to, you know, try to, you know, build the recovery effort in, the, in our local government area and you know, they had four priority areas for the local community that they, four priority areas for recovering us. Um, but no idea how they came up with those four priority areas. I don't know, that wasn't explained. Um, so we got this grant to run a citizens assembly and I'll just share the invite now so that you can see it. Um, so this has all happened very quickly. Um, so our question is, what do you want local government to do to build an inclusive, safe and fair society? Um, and it's just been so interesting. We're really, like I said, um, there are many people in this room who are more experienced than me. Um, so what I just hope you take away from this is that you don't have to be very knowledgeable, <laughs> as I'm not. Um, and that you never know who you're going to inspire or, or you know, the, that there's going to be some kind of spark, you know, it just takes a certain energy um, and that you taking some kind of action will let other people know that they can take some kind of action too. Um, and of course, it's good to have connections so that you can have some guidance and know what you're doing. Um, so what we, we really want to do is to try to engage people who might be disengaged currently. You know, there are lots of... Um, you know, during the COVID um, crisis, there was at one point, one of the suburbs within our municipality was a hotspot and they were the first ones to go into lockdown. Um, and that seemed to cause a little bit of division for a while. Um, you know, that, that area is much more multicultural than some other areas. And, and just starting to realize that there are lots of people in our area who don't feel like their voices are listened to or who aren't respected or who don't have the same opportunities as the rest of us. Um, so hopefully this Citizens Assembly will engage everyone, people who don't normally feel like they can ring up their councillors um, or engage in the process and bring people together. And I also think it's just important to, um, to show people that there are other ways of doing things. Um, and, you know, I think that's what we need. I think we all just need to throw energy into trying to do things differently. You know, obviously the system's not working. Um, it's broken. I say we need a completely new system. Um, but I think the beauty of citizens' assemblies is that, it, you know, they can work alongside our current political system. And I think they provide a really powerful link for us to take a, an enormous step away from this broken system into creating something that's more inclusive um, and something that, that respects all the people and, and, and all the creatures on the land. Um, I don't know how much more detail you want me to go into about the Citizens' Assembly or whether we should just open it up to questions? Sonia, what do you think? Um, yeah, I think we could open it up to questions because, um, and, um, yeah, unless people would prefer to go into small groups again, I think we should, we could open it up for questions. And if we don't get um, anything, then we could um, break into small groups again. So um, Lisa, I put a link for the registration for the event in the chat, um, which I can post again. Um, give me a sec. Does anyone have any other questions? Uh, Chris? I'll, I'll have a go. I'd be interested to know, either from Nerida or Sonia or anyone, um, what's, what's the cost to set up a citizens assembly and how long does it take to get up and running and how do you organize the experts? Uh, so the cost depends on a huge number of factors. 
um, let's, if you wanted to do, uh, I think Chris, you're interested in a national citizens assembly, um, then you'd be, and if you wanted it to be truly representative, then you're talking just in terms of the transport costs for people from remote communities is going to be um, tens of thousands of dollars. Then you've got accommodation costs. The cost of sending out invites can be quite high as well, depending upon how many invitations you're sending out. Um, then if you're paying for participation and that, it becomes cheaper if you're run, doing a sort of standing citizens assembly where people are chosen to meet on more than one occasion. So the Irish citizens assembly, they were chosen once to, um, to participate in five different, five assemblies on different topics each one running for about three to four meetings. The problem with that was it's been over the course of about five years. And of course there's been quite a bit of drop off and having to replace people um, and things like that. Um, in terms of how the experts are selected, um, again, the idea is to have a, an organizing committee usually that's made up of people who are respected on say, let's say both sides of politics that aren't, aren't going to cause any ripples in terms of their political biases. So in Ireland, it was chaired by a former High Court judge. Um, and so she was responsible for sifting through and trying to um, ensure that the experts were um, seen as being impartial. Um, and the other way of doing that is that the citizens who are part of the assemblies or juries themselves can also call people to give um, expert advice and opinions to the assembly. So, for, and that happened in the UK Climate Assembly, for example, and the one that I mentioned earlier about Kendall. Um, so those are um, two ways that that would happen. Um, I was wondering actually as well on, like for instance, Narada's example in Moreland, um, mm -hmm. like at a council level, what's the proposition look like at a local level? Um, so at the one that's happening for Thrive is um, being done largely pro bono by um, both for the selection and to, so most of the grant is actually going to reimburse participants rather than on any of the other costs. Um, so that one's not really that representative <laughs> of what the true cost would be. Um, and so it depends again upon how many people and how, whether or not, so there's one that's happening in Queenscliff at the moment where they're not reimbursing participants. Um, so that brings down the cost quite a lot. They figure that because it's going to be online and it's only held over three evenings that they don't feel that there is a need to reimburse or to offer a thank you to participants for their time. Um, and I, the cost of that one is probably less than, I would say less than $50,000 because the, I know that, and that's a sort of shoestring one with, um, I, I don't have any, privileged access to how much it actually costs. I'm just estimating. Um, I, that one consists of 18 participants, so it's quite a small number of people. It's only over three evenings. Um, so I suspect that that would be less than $50,000. And that's about as cheap as it would be. Um, I'll just jump in and say it hasn't run yet. Um, <laughs> some people have asked some questions. It's um, taking place at the end of um, November. Um, we're still working out some things. Um, so Bronwyn's asked about the expert panel. Um, there's still things that we have to work out. It's, um, we're organising this very quickly just because we want to make sure that we get this done. You know, the grant money was announced in October just last month. Um, and we want to make sure that we're doing this really quickly so that we can inform the new, um, new council that's being formed very soon. Um, so that's why we're organising things very quickly and that we haven't we haven't worked out everything yet. We're doing it on the fly and just trying to, you know, first it was the invitation um, and soon I'll we'll be able to work on the expert panel. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, we, we had to really scale it down because of the um, limitation of the cost, you know, because the grant was so small um, that we couldn't run it the way that we would ideally want to run it. But... You know, I, I don't think that this citizens assembly has to um, be the perfect citizens assembly. I think that we need to, you know, I think the most important thing is to engage um, people in our community um, and, and show people that there's another way. Um, and also, 
you know, try to make the voices of the Moreland people um, heard by the new council and take that into account. So even if it's not done perf perfect, um, perfectly, at least it'll make people realise that there are other options and, you know, pave the way for more citizens' assemblies. And that's what we'd like to see at our local council. So we'll be pushing for that. And just to say, I can't actually see if everyone raises their hands because there's two screens of people. Um, so you might raise, it, maybe it's best if you could either, I think if you click on the reactions button and raise your hand there, then I can see it, but not necessarily if you physically raise your hand. Um, the next question I'll go to is um, Sarah asked in the chat um, whether there were any good examples of deliberative democracy in Australia um, and any that other participants have been involved in. So has anyone here been involved in a citizens assembly at all I, um, as a participant? No, it doesn't seem like it. There was one, um, there's been quite a few. So um, we, I met Amy through a um, people's assembly that we held in the Hunter Valley um, with BZE to help inform their million jobs plan. And one of the reasons why BZE was interested was because the lead researcher on that had actually been involved in the gender equality citizens assembly here in Victoria. Um, so that was one that took place it wasn't that long ago, about two or three years ago. If you Google um, Gender Equality Citizens Assembly Victoria, it comes up and you can read some of the testimony and things there. One of the problems we have with the idea of citizens assemblies in Australia is that the there was the citizens jury in South Australia on nuclear waste and the it was basically um, a PR exercise that went wrong as far as the South Australian government was concerned. They went into the, the um, citizens jury thinking that they knew what the outcome would be and that obviously people would not respect the um, authority of traditional owners. They wouldn't respect the wishes of traditional owners. They wouldn't respect the need to, for health and safety of, the, of generations to come. And they would want the money that comes from nuclear waste dumping. Um, that's not what happened. The citizens jury very clearly, if you if you look at the websites and just look at the nice graphics that are shown, it doesn't really show the level of vitriol that the um, transcript shows of the participants saying, why on earth would we want something that's going to endanger the lives of our children like that, um, just for some money, you know, that kind of attitude. So, um, and then it was earlier this year, just before lockdown started happening here in Victoria anyway, that they announced where they were going to hold, where they were going to site the nuclear waste dump. They just completely ignored the results of the Citizens Assembly. And that um, further erodes people's trust in politicians and government and democratic processes. I think it's quite dangerous. Um, but we have had some good examples, as I say, the gender equality one, there was one on obesity as a statewide level in Victoria. There's been lots at local council level. Um, if you look at the Sortition Foundation website in about two weeks time, there should be a map that we're working on at the moment, which shows where all the different um, citizens assemblies have taken place around the world. Can I also just add, I think it was Felicity Farmer, wasn't it Felicity, that um, said that there was a Melbourne Council one and, and you've been a former councillor yourself. So is that an example we want to hear about, even though you perhaps weren't involved in it? Or... <laughs> who are you talking to though amy not me i just shared that 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 is written up oh, okay good sorry didn't see that post oh no 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 it's just um it was a resource i shared i mean just the, an example in our small group everyone okay yep. um and yes it's worth mentioning i'm sure but um i'm sure it, uh i haven't looked for the links but it will be online mm. Even at newdemocracy.org, um, whatever it is, they have, they'll have it there on their links. New Democracy Foundation, yeah. They, they, and they've got lots of good videos on their YouTube channel as well. Um, the next question I see in the chat is, can low income people be involved from Anthony? Um, not only can low income people be involved, they're often um, deliberately targeted 
So, for example, in um, Scotland, they they send out a number of invitations to homeless shelters to try and make sure that people who are experiencing vulnerability in terms of housing are able to get invitations and um, be part of the citizens' assemblies that they're holding. Um, and Scotland is um, using citizens' assemblies a lot um, on a variety of issues at the moment. Um, the most recent one, of course, was the Scottish Climate Assembly, which is worth looking at on Instagram or Twitter because they've got lots of really nice graphics about citizens' assemblies there. Um, so yes, not only can low-income people be involved, often they're actively sought after because it's recognized that they're a section of the community that very rarely is heard um, through sort of usual consultative processes and things like that. Amy and Nerida, do you want to say anything there? Anybody else want to say anything? Uh, okay. Um, the Citizens' Assembly on Brexit, um, where people were paid. Yep, and the one on Brexit was run by a university. It wasn't run by the government, but it helped to lead to um, discussions on government. And one of the reasons why, although there wasn't an official government one in the UK on Brexit, they have started using them. For example, the Citizens' Assembly on the climate crisis that finished recently. Um, I'm just scrolling down to see like Scotty was asking what would a rolling citizens assembly look like a permanent one <gasps> this is where I start getting really excited <laughs> um so it could take also so um it would be quite possible to have a citizens let's let's start with the senate imagine if we replace the senate with a citizens assembly that had the same number of people and was replaced in the same way that senators are. Um, so it, you can imagine that instead of us having votes, you'd have uh, the people selected to be demographically representative of the states from which the, the current senators sit. So they would play a similar role, they'd be briefed in a similar way to incoming senators, um, and they would have the power so over legislation that the current second house has. Um, we think that in Queensland, there might be a really interesting um, role for a second house that's chosen by, by sortition there. Um, so this is something that I think is really worth discussing. In the longer run, you could imagine that the um, instead of having the lower house chosen by election, again, you could have it chosen by sortition. It would mean that the civil servants would play a very different role than they do at the moment. Um, you could still have elections within the lower house for the people who are elected to the different portfolios. So you'd still have ministers and things like that, but they, could, it, they wouldn't have the same party political affiliations. So there would be a very different dynamic to parliament. You wouldn't have, as you do at the moment, the cross ben the benches facing each other in a way that is set up for confrontation rather than for discussion and de um, deliberation. So um, I think that there's lots of different ways in which standing citizens assemblies could work. They could work as advisory bodies, which has been proposed um, by Macron of all people in France. Um, he proposed a third body that would be an advisory body to um, the existing um, elected legislative bodies in France. So it's not, a completely off the wall idea. I mean, Macron is a fairly mainstream, hardly radical um, left of center politician. So, you know, um, it's something that's entering mainstream chat and mainstream discussion. So I think it's worth talking about and spreading the idea and getting the discussions going because I don't think there's one answer. And I don't think that I have that answer by any stretch of the imagination. But I think that it's a really, important thing to be talking about and discussing. And, and Sonia, um, if I could just add, I've posted in the chat a link to um, what's happening in one of the regional jurisdictions in Belgium, where they've actually set this up as a permanent structure. Um, where, and it started last year, so it's been going for 12 months now, obviously not in a normal year, but um, 
uh, there they have um, started um, having citizens assemblies and it's been built into legislation um, uh, to involve people on a sortition by lot. They'll draw people down by lot um, uh, to be involved in the actual political decision making. So it has um, a really strong mandate in terms of the decisions that will come out of it. And I, I just wanted to add that one of the things um, in order for citizens assemblies to get that kind of legitimacy and to get people having confidence, um, one of the things that's really quite important to try and establish in advance is um, uh, some form of understanding and commitment about what will happen with the recommendations of a citizens assembly before they come out. So one of the big negotiations that needs to be had is with whoever, whichever jurisdiction actually has the, um, the governance mandate, that there is a commitment and that that commitment is public about what they will do with the results. And if they're um, only prepared to consider them as recommendations, that has to be really clear up front. But if there's a, um, you know, if, and, and that makes a huge difference to people's um, participation, their expectations, and also the kind of outcome in the community afterwards and their confidence to participate. Can you say something about how that public commitment to even doing it was engendered leading up to it? Um, for, the, for Belgium? Mm. Um, I can do, but, but I'll just um, do a quick time check because we're supposed to finish at 8.30. Um, so if anybody else wants to um, hang on, we could have a discussion about that. And also Libby was asking to explain again how sortition works, which I'm more than happy to do. Um, but recognizing that we are going over time already um, with that. So give people a chance to leave now if they want to. There will be a recording of, of this, but there will be a long break in the middle of the recording where I forgot to stop recording while we went out into breakout rooms. Okay. Um, so Karen, did you want to answer that question from Andrew? Sorry, I didn't catch the question, Andrew. Um, what can you say about the process that led up to um, even getting one of these major citizen assemblies operating, public will? How did that happen? Um, look, I wasn't involved and, I, and I'm not... Um, uh, you know, I'm not that cognizant of the of the process to be able to give you a, a good idea, but I know there was a lot of discussion and negotiation and an international um, uh, committee put together um, to develop the ideas and the concepts. And in fact, I understand that um, straight, um, the new um, Democracy Foundation I think people from Australia in the New Democracy Foundation were part of that international group. And certainly, I think getting involved, if you, if you check their website, there'll be more information on that. Um, uh, but yeah, I think it was a long process over um, quite a period of time. Uh, obviously, going forward, we can all learn from these experiments, but to get something like that built. Um, into the um, democratic, democratic process in a country is, is amazing. I think that's a really good step. Uh, what happened to my understanding is that there was a crisis within the Belgium National Assembly where there wasn't, for a, quite a long period, there weren't any parties that could form a government because no party outright had a majority during that really long process where they didn't have a government, there were a group of citizens that started a movement called the G1000, which it, it's worth Googling and, and reading up a bit more about it. Um, that was a deliberative democratic process. It was self-selecting, um, but they were about to start their own sortition process to form a, par a real parallel government because the politicians couldn't decide who should be governing them when the politicians basically um, 
started to find that they could cooperate when the, the threat was big enough. Um, but it was out of that experience and that the, the deliberations that happened within the G1000 groups that the momentum built that led to the change in East Belgium, Ost Belgium, the, the regional one. Um, it was also partly that the mayor was a really strong advocate. So there was the personal leadership as well as the grand swell movement from below. Elsewhere, it's largely been because politicians again, crisis has helped to breed change. Um, they've often found that on issues such as Brexit, where they couldn't come to solutions, then a citizens assembly looks like a, an attractive way to move things forward. Um, and that's certainly been, I think was part of the driver between, behind the, um, the climate assembly that the UK held recently. Um, on a local council level, it's to a large extent because it's seen as being an effective way of engaging the community. Um, because a lot of local councillors do get fed up with just hearing the same voices over and over again that come to the community consultations. And so it's a way of getting new people in the room. Um, so I think that's partly why on a local council level that they have, there's been a lot more take up. There's also been changes in Victoria to the Local Government Act. Some of them were good, some of them bad, but one of the good things that changed was that um, the Act says that certain part, like the council vision and things like that have to be, um, they have to undertake a process of deliberative democracy. It doesn't define what that is, but it means that there's a lot more interest in those ideas here in Victoria um, than there was before the changes to the Local Government Act. Um, so I'll go on to Libby's question um, about how sortition works. I actually have, um, but I didn't uh, do it today. I will be doing one at the um, Nina Assembly, if you come, uh, mock sortition exercise. I have my little bucket that I literally draw names out of for the process of demonstrating how sortition works. But that's basically what it is. It's basically a more complicated form of drawing names out of a hat. So you basically, let's say that you were choosing along the lines of um, just, I'm just going to choose two variables, gender and socioeconomic status. And I wanted to choose 10 people and I wanted five people who were, who identify as male and five people who identify as female. And I want two people from each of the five, um, uh, let's say five income groups. So the richest, I want two people from the richest section, two people from the next section and so on. We're pretending we live in an, a world where income is split in a way that there's only two people, there's two people in the top and two people in the bottom, whereas we know that that's not really how the income curve works. So if I take out the first name, let's say I take out the first five names, there are four women um, and one man. Um, and the sixth name I choose, and they are all from the lo lower in lowest income bracket. If I pick any more names out of the hat that are from the lowest income bracket, they would automatically be excluded because I've already got my two names. So out of those five names, the first two that I choose, who are both women from the lowest income bracket, they get selected. Then nobody else, anybody else who's in the lowest income bracket would be excluded. And I could only choose people from the other four income brackets. So I, those three have been excluded. Then I pick out another um, three people who are all women. So now I've already got my five women because they were all in different income brackets. So after that, I have to choose men because I've already got my five women. Does that help to explain it? Libby? Oh, how did that get in the hat? <laughs> okay, so the way that it gets into the hat in real life is that there is a, so um, the way that the Sortition Foundation do, does it, who I, um, have started working for since the start of um, since earlier this year um, is they send so they'll take a database of for example addresses so like the Australia Post database and send out invitations to randomly selected addresses from that database so um, the to take the UK Climate Assembly they use the Royal Mail database, they sent out 30,000 invitations to households and anybody in those households could register 
to um, be part of the assembly. Um, when they registered, they had to, they provided name, date of birth, um, address, so that we could do we could do it geographically, do it by um, that we asked them to identify as either male, female, or non-binary. And then there were other questions, which included, for example, an attitudinal question on climate, um, questions on level of education, because that's often a proxy for socioeconomic status, um, and things like that. So, and then using those, that's how, so anybody that registered, their names were cross-checked to see that they'd got an invitation. So that people who were had very strong views but did not get an invitation could not register to be part of the assembly. Um, and then there were about a thousand people that registered, and out of those thousand people, 110 were chosen. Two dropped out before the um, assembly started, so there were 108 people in the assembly. Oh, okay, thanks. And did you say if you were trying to target homeless people, you would what go to shelters or something like that? So they um, they. So in Scotland, yes, they t they sent invitations to shelters and spoke to the staff there, um, and that was the government staff that did that to to encourage them to um, encourage the residents to apply. So it was people in vulnerable, and there's a, a phrase for it which is slipping my mind right now. But yeah, people in um, unstable housing situations. Okay, thanks. No problem. So I'm going to scroll down. I'm not well, there's a lot of conversation going on, but I'm going to have to go soon. Um, and yes, I, I, Michael asks if the lot is based on demographics. So I hope that I've answered that. I've posted a link in the chat to the NINA um, Democracy and Governance Hub. Um, I'm, I'm hearing from people that um, people would like to keep in touch and um, we, we started to hold um, a monthly um, sort of get together on um, Zoom um, and so if you go to that hub um, you'll be able to find out how to get on to that and it's a great way for people here to keep in touch and you know we, it could take us anywhere could be wonderful. So anyone who wants to um, follow up after this, we really welcome you to um, get in touch and um, yeah, see you then. I don't know about anyone else, but we had some really amazing discussions in our breakout room and if all the other breakout rooms were anything like that, yes, let's keep in touch. Agreed, Karen. Thanks, Amy. Okay, are we calling it? I'm, I'm going to shut down this group now and hopefully we'll have this up as a webinar that people can watch. Hmm. Well, thank you, everyone. And thank you very much to both Amy and Nerida for. Hmm. Thank you. And Karen for helping behind the scenes and Michelle and Nina. Thanks, everyone who organised and thanks to everyone who came.